The Business of Agriculture is brought to you by Land Trust. Have you heard how landowners are increasing profitability by adding recreation to their portfolio of land use? Millions of outdoor recreators seek wide open spaces for bird watching, photography, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, and many other farm and ranch activities. Landowners are partnering with the Recreation Access Network Land Trust. Land Trust is an online platform connecting recreators with landowners for outdoor experiences on their land to increase profitability. Visit LandTrust.com slash BOA, as in Business of Agriculture, to learn more. That's LandTrust.com slash BOA. Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast. It is me, your host, Damian Mason, with a great program for you. We're talking about what business-minded farms should know in 2022. We're recording this heading into December of 2021 with information we have on hand and foresight that we have looking forward. We want to be talking, uh, we are going to be talking about the things that you should know. And if you're in any aspect of agriculture, because let's face it, it all starts to farm level. Level. I've got Chris Barron and Shay Folk. They are with AgView Solutions. Chris has been on this podcast before. He's also been a guest with my Business of Ag Success Group, small networking group where we meet twice a month via Zoom, which if you're not a part of, I encourage you to consider being a part of for just $100 a month. We bring in great guests like Chris for question and answer. But today we're talking to these guys, Shay and Chris who are with AgView Solutions, who also have a summit coming up in January for business-minded farms to help them be prepared to succeed in 2022. So we're giving a little preview of that. We're talking about three big topics. We're going to be hitting on financials. We're going to be hitting on tools for decision-making. We're going to be talking about proactive planning. And it's all going to tie into, again, Mm -hmm. what we see happening in the marketplace rolling into the year 2022 as a lot has changed. Shay and Chris Barron, thank you for being here on the Business of Agriculture podcast. Good to be here with you, Damien. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. So what business-minded farms should know in 2022? And I should say that there is a matter of background because some people do not know you. I do. You have been uh, on this air before. Real quick background on both of you, please. I'll go ahead and start then. Um, Chris Barron, basically, we uh, we started working with producers about uh, 25 years ago to understand the financials. And then that's kind of morphed into everything from transition to business planning to Um, We facilitate some peer groups and we work with farmers in about 18 states across the U.S. and some in Canada as well, uh, primarily on financial. Yeah. So your thing was 25 years ago, you were a business minded guy with a farm background from eastern Iowa. And then you started working with farms on the financials of of making them uh, stay solvent uh, and then profitable. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then I farm too in Northeast Iowa with my family and and actively still farm today, which I think probably is one of the things that adds to our credibility because we live and breathe the same emotional uh, constraints and all the same challenges. So, you know, um, I think living it makes it a lot more credible when when we're trying to help people with decision making through a lot of critical challenges. Yeah, and you're not you're not out there with 20 acres uh you know in a John Deere 4020 and a in a 10 foot disc. You actually <laughs> you're actually legitimately farming uh yeah. the family operation that you're a part of is a few thousand acres, correct? Yeah, yeah, we farm in collaboration. We're running about 7,000 acres with a couple of other partners and then we have a machinery and equipment company, a trucking business and uh multiple, doing that to uh, sort of multiple. pools i remember you do that to sort of pool and shave down cost uh cost of equipment per per acre right yep we have we have a machinery company that services our whole team and uh basically the same with our trucking business and then we we also have an insurance agency and a pioneer sales um agency so we have a few things going on besides the the farm and then obviously the consulting as well so today we're talking mostly about the consulting and uh, the, what you would advise your clients and are advising your clients. And again, those clients are in where, and Shay is more on the consulting side because he's in a different part of Iowa, but he is more on the consulting and this aspect of the business. He's not on the production ag side uh, right now, correct? 
No, so, he is. <laughs> yeah, originally from Northeast Iowa as well. I went off to the military and was in Savannah, Georgia for five years. Didn't do anything agriculture related. And when I came back and joined the uh, consulting operation here, I also got integrated into my in-laws operation here in Northwest Illinois. And so we're row crop production as well. We run a seed business and kind of the keys that I focus on within the consulting business is, you know, that military experience of decision-making communication within your team, cost of production management. And, and one of the biggest things that I think, you know, Chris said the word uh, credibility or the fact that we're living this every day is we're currently going through a transition in our farm operation. So that transition planning and multi-generation uh, dynamics there is really crucial. So that's my background. That's how I'm involved with Chris. And, you know, to answer your question there on where our clients are located, really all over uh, the United States and Canada, we work with people in every aspect, these, you know, business minded farm operations that are taking the professionalism to the next level. Those are the clients that we work with. Fantastic. So we have, I mean, big picture and I'll just throw what you know, we all hear about it if we keep up. Uh, okay, supply chain agricultural inputs. Is there going to be fertilizer? I had somebody reach out to me wanting me to be a media guest. Are there going to be food shortages? Because we won't have any fertilizer. You know, <laughs> a little bit of they want to push the paranoia, and that, and that's how media works. You know, we got to sell uh -huh. the fear, sell the fear. And I unfortunately on the one uh, I said. We're going to have a lot more. Um, we're going to have a lot more improvisation to do in ag, but uh, generally, one thing I can tell you about American agriculture is we're productive as hell, and we really find a way to do that, and we will continue to do so. We've got the whole um, pricing issue, and so we got supply chain. Will there be uh, inputs? Uh, we've got the fact that five hundred dollar and fifty eight cent corn looked really good a year ago, and now with all these input prices, it may not. It may look like break even. So we got those kinds of things. We got availability of even machinery. It was already going to be a little tight than the John Deere thing. I'm just thinking of big picture stuff. Um, got some regulatory issues going on. Um, the Biden administration pushing out uh, what might be a whole bunch of regulations, and it might also be a package, the whole climate package, as it were, the infrastructure climate package. And that will have, it looks like, tentacles into agriculture in terms of things we're going to do. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on, but you're focusing on three big things, financials, tools of decision-making and farm level proactive planning. And I think what you're going to tell me is a bunch of these tie into all those other things as we roll into 2022. So start me with financials. All right. I'll, I'll start there gladly. That's, that's the Did I miss anything by the way. No, you so. nailed it. And it, the, the key here before we jump into it though, Damien, you said a lot of things there and some of those are inside factors that we can control. Okay. Some of them are outside factors and we want to make sure we're differentiating those the inside factors are what you can control and the outside factors just happen to influence those decisions. So Chris on the financials there. Uh, by the way, I like that inside factors, outside factors. And then sometimes you do the inside factors just to insulate yourself from the outside factors. Right. Yeah. And, and, and like Shay said, those are the things that you can control. You need to stay focused on. You need to pay attention to the things you can't control so you can see what's coming your way so you can dodge and dart. But on the same token, you know, there are so many things that we can do in the business of our agriculture systems, whether we're a retailer or we're a farmer or whatever we are, um, you know, it's all about having plan A. But I think in the environment we're in right now, whether it's financial or what it is, we better have plan B and probably plan C because you don't know what's coming your way right now um, with as crazy as things have been going. We haven't gotten a black swan the last couple of years. We've gotten a whole flock of them. Yeah, right. And, and so, you know, so we start with the financials. One of the first things we do when we're, we sit down with the producers, we say, you know, and especially if they're a brand new client, the first thing we ask them is how do you define growth? You know, what does growth mean to your business? And you, you, you really got to define that and think about what that is, because in these multi-generational businesses, you've got different generations within the business trying to make decisions and trying to keep everybody on the same page. The only way you get everybody pretty much on the same page is you, you use numbers and you let the numbers start to begin to drive the conversation so that they can help drive the decisions. And so... Um, what we're looking at right now, as an example of that currently, that we've got a, quite a bit of data on is crop rotation. You know, for example, um, specifically what we're noticing and what we're hearing from some of the lenders, some of our clients' lenders. In fact, we've got 
um, some of our clients coming to us as, as they work with us, the bankers coming along because we're looking at, okay, what's this 22 look like? Because we have, infl uh, we have inflation here that's not apparently not transitory anymore. This is something that's continuing and it looks like it's gonna, it's gonna go for some time. When you look at machinery and equipment, you look at all of the inputs. And so as we look at those and we compare 21 to 22, I'll just use real quick soybeans and corn as an example, we're looking at the cost of production on corn going up $166 an acre on average with our clients right now versus what the cost was last year. So if you have a thousand acres of corn, you're looking at another $170,000 of cash you better have available to operate your business just on that thousand acres of corn production. And you know if you have a, a thousand acres of soybeans, now you're talking a 2000 acre farm that's 50-50, you know, we're looking at about $65 an acre of increased costs there. So you just, just, just to, cause I, I like the numbers, but you know, they taught me once uh, in terms of being a presenter and Shay, this would be valuable for you because you're doing more of this. 40% of the uh, populace is visual. The numbers. Yeah. 40% is very feeling and only 20% are auditory. And since podcasts are auditory in general, when you throw a lot of numbers out there, I think it's important to back them up a second time because we got to appeal to everybody. Right. You just said that to produce an acre of corn projection right now for the new year is going to be $166 more per acre of cost yep. uh, than it was in, in crop season 21, correct? Correct. And then you said on the soybean number, 65? $65 an acre. So what I'm saying is that in a, if you have a 2,000 acre farm and your 50-50 rotation, you know, you're looking at a lot of operations are going to be pushing over 200, dollars almost a quarter million dollars of additional working capital just to, to put in the same crop as what you did in 21. And so that's really, I think the take, take home message on the financials is, you know, when you start looking at your, your plans from a financial perspective, number one, what's that debt service look like? What's your working capital position look like? And, you know, because a lot of producers are coming off a pretty good year. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in Northeast Iowa and we had a drought this year and we had, we matched our record yield that we've ever had. And, and I guess if that's what a drought brings, I guess I want to drought again next year because we had record, you know, we had record yields. I don't know where it came from, but we also have really high prices. And in the career that my career of agriculture, I've been, doing this for about 30 years now. And I have never seen where you have price and yield both. Usually you either get yield or you get price. You don't get both of them. And I'm speaking for producers in about 11 or 12 states that we, we're seeing this in. Now there's pockets where, where the yields were bad, but crop insurance kicks in and fixed a lot of situations too. I know there's exceptions to that, but um, I think what we have to do is understand that first. And then we have to be looking at 22 and say, okay, back to your supply chain issues. Um, what if you can't get certain products? Do you have plan B financially planned? You know, so you can easily transition to the next thing. So, you know, one other part of the financial thing too, uh, of what is available. We were talking about this a little bit beforehand on even equipment availability a lot of this comes back to your your capital expenses and the capital expenditures that you have played into this. So ignore the other factors of the inflation, the increased input costs. Most operations are making big financial decisions right now as they have more cash on hand from the last year and this year and projected even yet for 2022, they're looking to make these big decisions. So you know, what business minded farms need to know for 2022 is you better be looking pretty close at these numbers because the last time we had this experience was 2013 and 2014 after another period of financial success. And some operations are looking back at that time frame, wishing they had done things differently, but maybe didn't have the tools in place to better make those decisions. So another key piece of that financial outlook is how are we going to manage this equipment and some of the intermediate assets that we have in our operation. Thank you, Shay. You have a working capital sheet because since we already said that 40% of the people are visual learners, um, 
uh, we can put it up on the screen right now. Most people are listening to this, not watching it, but a reminder to you, dear listeners, you can go to the Damian Mason channel on YouTube. Just type in Damian Mason, hit subscribe, and you can watch all my podcasts there. But also, uh, if you really want to see this, you can get a hold of them or you can get a hold of me. And, and we can do that through Agview Solutions or through DamianMason.com. And we're happy to kick this to you. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably actually do a thing here where I'll, where I'll have my editor put this in over what we're talking about so that you visual learners can check this uh, screen out. Um, okay, let's talk about that money thing. And what you just said is really interesting, Shay. 2013, high watermark. Uh, I predicted it was going to be 2012, but then 2012 was a drought. And so at least our part of the world, the Midwest. Um, so then 2013 became the high watermark. It's when land hit its zenith. That's when uh, 2014 did actually, because land usually follows by a year. So we pretty much can look at that as, boy, that was the last big year. And then what you just said was interesting. It's like, wait a minute, these guys made a boatload of money. What the hell happened? How are things bad then in 2014, the next year? Tell them what happened because of the working capital, the person that's not very money minded. Some of my people are listening to this. They're brilliant at putting green beans in a can, but they're like saying, what are you talking about? Explain that a little bit. Well, Damien, I don't know if you've accidentally uh, ever bought a boat or anything. That's kind of the terminology that Chris uses, but you know, we have this influx, influx of cash. What we typically see in these periods of success is uh, not only does the income increase, but also your return to management. What are you taking as an owner's draw? What are you taking as improvements in the operation? Uh, what are those life and business and equipment upgrades that you've been waiting to make? Well, you got a lot of dollars sitting in this pool all at once. It doesn't mean it's going to last as we know with the success and how these cycles go. And, you know, it pretty quickly tailed off after that 2013 uh, you know, we had a period there of some reduced yields, uh, prices went back down to uh, more reasonable levels or, or more normal levels, I guess you could call it. And we're seeing some of that occur right now, you know, with this equipment purchasing that's going on. I know of a lot of dealerships right now that are late 2022 or even into 2023 on new orders coming in for machinery. Some of that's paired with the global issues that we have going on as well, but it's pretty quick to erase that working capital if you're not adequately managing uh, your equipment purchases, your intermediate intermediate asset purchases, and even your debt management. You know, that's the other thing in relation to working capital. Just because you have a lot of cash on hand right now, you need to have a plan in place on how you're going to manage that debt and set yourself up for success well beyond 2022, just because we're experiencing a period of financial success right now. Chris. You haven't said anything for a minute, so I know you're thinking. Yeah, well. Yeah, no, I, mean, I don't yeah. have a boat. By the way, I don't. I have bad habits. <laughs> yeah. But I don't have a boat. Okay. Yeah, well, everybody has has a habit that they spend money on. And I think one of the, the scary things to me is, is, you know, as Shay said, I, I've jokingly said that for a number of years, especially coming off of, you know, from about 2008 to 2012, there was a lot of profit. There were a couple of years there where all people had to do was wake up and they were making money. And I jokingly would say, you know, in, if you accidentally bought a boat, that's part of your cost of production because part of what whatever you take out of your business, I don't care if you're a retailer, you're a farmer, you own an airline, whatever comes out of there for draws to pay the employees, the owners, any, any of those things, a lot of times I have farmers tell me, well, I'm not taking a draw, so there's no, there's no overhead costs for, for my farm business. And then I'll ask the question, well, how do you fill your, your car with gas? Well, I got a gas barrel out here. Oh, okay, well, that's part of, okay, let's start adding up. So who pays for the light bill here in the house? Oh, well, I guess the farm pays that. You know, so you start adding all of those things up. That's that return to management. The scary thing is, as Shay said, is we, we come off a very good year, we make bad decisions in good times, and we make really good decisions in bad times. We need to reverse that around a little bit because what I'm, and I haven't seen anybody do this yet, but I guarantee I'm gonna see it somewhere. Maybe somebody didn't accidentally bought a boat, buy a boat, but they might've accidentally bought a lake house <laughs> or, or a house in Florida or somewhere that's really expensive right now. And then when the value, goes back down all of a sudden you know some of the things that you buy when prices are high it, it affects you on on the deflationary side too when things go the other way and so i guess that's that's my take on it i think we just got to be really careful that we're making good decisions you know during good times really important 
And, and maybe a more practical uh, farm business example uh, for those that are, are heavily invested or have a high amount of machinery right now. I was talking with a producer yesterday afternoon, actually, and he made the comment that during this time period in 2013, their farm operation upgraded their whole line of machinery. And that was great. That's been great for them for the last seven or eight years. But now, eight years down the road, they're looking at a tremendous cost uh, for upgrade and they're starting to see a huge amount of expenses and maintenance and repairs. They haven't realized that over time, you know, and so they're kicking themselves a little bit. Should we have, should we have traded all of that at once or should we have been trading more so along the way in times like Chris said, you know, maybe when we're not as profitable, are there decisions that we need to be making in those times that make us better producers? So just, that might just be a little bit more practical. So Shay, they, they would say it should have staggered it a little bit. There's also depreciation game. We're going to talk about that probably when we get into more tools. Real quickly, define working capital. I got somebody listening to this is like, hey, Damon, this is really cool. What the hell is working capital? I mean, I got money. Is that what working capital is? Well, it's your it's your cash on hand and it's your your short term assets that you have either prepaid or that you have that's liquid. In other words, you know what you can get your hands on. That's just the most basic way to explain it. And so the problem is that um, we get we're feeling really good right now. Uh, We saw these things. They sold some land over there in Iowa for twenty thousand dollars an acre. Well, I got some land. Twenty six five. Yeah, well, maybe mine's not worth twenty six five, but it's probably worth twenty. So I mean, so I'm feeling really good. I got all kinds of money. But uh, then the point you're making is you have assets, but you don't have working capital. You don't have cash on hand. You say, "Oh crap! I need that hundred six dollars now to plant that hundred six dollars more to plant that acre of corn." And then boomity boomity boomity. All of a sudden, what are we doing then? Are we going and grabbing uh, more operating money against those assets that are worth so much? Is that what we're going to do? Well, what we're seeing. And, and again, there's always exceptions to everything, but what we're seeing is we're coming off of 20 was a pretty good year um, for a lot of producers. We had PPP, we had CFAP, we had a whole bunch of other stuff. So even if we didn't have yield, we had income. Those are government okay. programs for those who may not be familiar with that yeah. terminology. You know, yeah. it's income that was designed to uh, bring relief from farm operations in the form of uh, employment for their employees and or for some of the damage they might have experienced in crops from the year before or from the economic downturn globally. So go ahead, Chris. Right. And so, you know, when you see a good year like that, coupled with another good year, generally speaking, um, that's it's setting a lot of people up for the opportunity to make some good decisions or some bad decisions really quick here. Uh, is it time to move into tools to uh, help your decision making? I think it is. It is. It is. And I, you know, the segue that I would have here as we move from the financial outlook into some of these tools and business decision making uh, for risk management is exactly the question that you asked there, Damien. And is, are we just borrowing more money or what are we doing? And for some producers, some farm operations out there, that's the case. You know, they need to have a plan in place to go to their lenders, to go to the people that they're working with show them why they need more money to operate. And the kicker of it is, is, you know, when Chris and I look at these projections on a year to year basis from 2021 to 2022, we're staring down the barrel of another profitable year in 2022, uh, you know, assuming the yield is there and uh, the environmental conditions. Yeah, no, no weather, no weather disasters, no crazy stuff. Um, you're, you're, you're probably projecting you're going to be okay next year. Yeah, those are outside factors, right? And so, you know, when we look at that, we're still looking in some some cases of 15, 20, 25% profit margin, uh, whereas over the last six or seven years, some operations have been in that three to 8% profit margin or negative. You know, maybe they've been losing money for, for a lot of years here in a row. So it's been a long time since we've seen this amount of profitability on the table. And, you know, I think the key here and what farm businesses should know as they move into 2022 is they need to have tools in their hand that help them make these decisions. They need to have tools that when they go to their lenders, when they go to the people on their strategic resource teams, whether that's their, um, you know, CPA, you know, their accountant or their attorney or the uh, business partners that they're working with in general, they need to have tools in their hands so they're making good decisions when things are good and not waiting until things are bad to really crunch those numbers. So that's where some of the tools that, um, you know, Chris and I work with and or that are just available to people out there 
really come into play as we look at 2022 here? You talk about using some technology. Those are tools like advisory. Uh, when you said CPA banker, those are relationships and, and uh, you know, consultancy, like what you guys do. You obviously are a tool because you're like, hey, hey, uh, I think maybe I do a really good job of growing crops, but I'm not sure that I'm completely well versed over here. Can you help me? And that's what you guys do, right? You say, well, let's look at your numbers. When you do that, are they reluctant to share their numbers? No. Uh, I would say, Chris, 95% of the operations that we work with understand that transparency uh, is the key to those decision making. We probably wouldn't show up unless we knew we were going to get to look at the numbers. <laughs> In fact, you know, what we tell people is we want we want to see everything, you know. Um, we can't, we can only help people if we can know everything. And it's, and it's really critical that we understand what's going on in the whole entire operation with commu- everything from communication to the generational dynamics. I mean, a lot of times we, we uh, will sit there and, and the second thing after we talk about growth is we'll ask, you know, okay, talk to us about what's working in the business. Tell us what's working really good. And we'll go around with everybody that's on the team and each one gets to tell us what's working. Then we go around and say, all right, what's not working. And we, and we write that stuff down and we start that conversation based on that about 80% of the time, the thing that always boils to the top is communication, you know, and typically a lot of times with these multi-generational businesses that we work with, you have a generational difference of where the priorities are from one decision to the next. And it might be machinery and equipment replacements. It might be, you know, it might be buying that piece of land. It might be how many hours in a day you're working. It might be all the above or a whole mm-hmm. bunch of other stuff. And so, you know, so we go through the financials, but we go way deeper than that because you can get all the numbers right. And if communication breaks down, you're screwed because mm-hmm. you have to get that stuff right. And so we don't show up and just do one facet. We try to be the conduit between the CPA, between the banker, between, you know, your attorney, all those types of things. Cause we're, we're helping them work through transition. We're helping them work through collaborations. We're helping them work through communication. All those things are all just as important. And, you know, and like Shay said, from a tool standpoint, we have financial tools, but we also have management tools with best practices to communicate better, whether it's working on core values, whether it's working on, you know, setting up their accountability chart. So each, each family member knows what roles and responsibilities are. A lot of times we'll ask a, an employee, we'll say, you know, who's your boss? Who's your direct report? Well, I don't know all three brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they're frustrated because, you know, the leadership is not clearly defined. And so, you know, we, we sit there and we work through these financials and obviously I'm pretty passionate about the financials, but it doesn't matter. We do that first. So we have the numbers to guide us, but we have to get the communication. We have to make sure we're getting along. And that's what the farm operations have to know. They have to know, do you have a good transition plan? What's the last time you looked at your will? You know, have you, have you, you know, what happens if tomorrow you get ran over by a beer truck and you're the one that that's doing all the accounting? And you can't do it anymore, or you're the one that runs a planter or the sprayer, or if you're a retailer and you're sitting there at the hub making all the purchasing decisions or all the marketing decisions and you're gone tomorrow, do you have people cross-trained? So a lot of stuff to, to work on. So Damien, I, I love what you said there, because when we were talking on tools initially, in my mind, I, I go to spreadsheets, right? Because that's what we do. That's what we're passionate about. And they help make good business decisions. But what you said there on the advisory and the relationships part, you know, there's now na- an analogy out there. Farmers have a, a toolbox, right? And, and who is on your strategic resource team? That's just the fancy way of saying who are the people that help you make decisions in your operation. Yeah. So whether it's your lender or your attorney or your accountant, these are all tools that you need to reach out and and not just listening to, you know, the consultants or the market analyst or whoever's out there, they're all part of that team, but you need to talk to each one of them individually and say, what do I need to be thinking about in 2022? So if there's a farm business out there listening, they haven't had contact with these people or think they're thinking, man, I need to touch base with them. Now's the time to do it. And, and some of those people on that strategic resource team are a 916 cent trench. You know, they're 916s. That's what they do. They're attorneys. They are attorneys. And that's it. That's what they do. 
some of those are crescent wrenches, right? And they can, they can be a variable. That's kind of where your consultant and your advisory fits in. Uh, sometimes a crescent wrench can be a hammer too, a kind of hitting things in and, and driving the message home. So I would say that uh, in my business dealings in 28 years of running my own uh, enterprise, um, the worst thing in the world is when you uh, let some people that are a 916th inch wrench think that they've evolved into being uh, a, a, an entire an entire plethora of tool in the toolbox because really they just should stay the 916th. Uh, sometimes a lawyer should just go ahead and set up your legal documents and an accountant should just just do your financial, uh, your, your taxes. They shouldn't actually be advising. Oftentimes I think um, accountants shouldn't be advising on things outside of just tax compliance. And uh, they sometimes then start thinking, well, no, well, let's look at your big picture. I'm like, I'm not sure that that's really what you, I think a financial <laughs> advisory uh, position would be the person for that. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Decision-making. Um, the one thing that I see in these agricultural people that are not, in my opinion, good business minded farms is they avoid that, which they don't like, you know, the guy that I put up, I wrote about it in my business book. Uh, the guy that loves to do bench presses, by God, you go to the gym and he's in there just doing bench presses and blowing and, and he stands and looks at himself in the mirror and then his legs look like this pin, you know, a little, little pink because he loves doing bench presses. We're a little bit that way when our, we run our own businesses. You know, I, I tend to do things that uh, I like first and put off things that I don't like or I'm not good at. And we're that way definitely on farms. Man, I'm really good at wrench. I just want to go in the shop and wrench on stuff. I'm like, you know, um, this business, this, this, this farm is a business and it's not a wrenching business. It's a grain selling mm. f- agricultural product producing business. And if there is no desk time, then all of a sudden this business goes away and you're going to be sitting here in your shop wondering, you know, where your toys went, your thoughts. I'll draw you a picture, uh, not literally, but figuratively. So you can picture this in your mind, but draw a circle and put a whole bunch of dots in the middle of that circle. Just keep putting dots in the middle of that circle and keep doing it, right? Yeah. That's you That's you working in your business, okay? You're just working and working and working, and you're doing all kinds of things. Now, think about it if you would step outside of that and draw another big circle around that circle and then start putting some dots in that ring. Just a few of them, though, okay? Mm-hmm. That's working on your business. Mm-hmm. So what happens is we spend so much time working in the business that we don't see what's going on outside of the business. So we have to step back mm. and we have to say, okay, from 30,000 feet, what's really going on? What am I missing here? And that's where sometimes we have to, we show up a lot of times and the light bulb goes off. We have to help turn the light switch on yeah. because, because we get so ingrained with what we're doing. And it's exactly like what you said, Damien, and you, and you did, you made some great points in the book um, with regard to that, that hit home to me massively because um you know that's exactly what we see is people love driving tractors people love running the combine people love you know but when we show up and if people have had a really good year and they made a bunch of money the last thing they want to do is sit there and figure out exactly how much their expenses are and exactly what their margin is because that's not nearly as much fun as running the combine yeah, looking at, the, looking at the yield monitor and then that spring fever of running that planter and getting the, getting all that st- seed in the ground, that's exciting stuff. Like, yeah. okay, what do your numbers look like? Okay. Yeah, and, okay. and w- what makes me nervous a lot of times is when, and back to the when when times aren't as good, all of a sudden we're a little more popular. I mean, we'll get, we'll get more phone calls when, you know, corn's at $350 and, and beans are at $9 than we do when commodity prices are higher, we work with some large dairies, we work with a, um, some hog operations and, and some other business um, entities as well. And when things are going really good, it's really easy to kind of slough a few things off because again, you either don't want to do it or you, you aren't able or willing to give up control. And that's one of the things, too, that that we like to encourage people to do is when we ask what's not working, we can we can start drilling down and we can funnel down to some of the things that they need to know in their business. They, they sort of know it probably subconsciously, but they won't admit it to themselves until you have a third party there that sometimes can say, OK, you know, maybe you need to hire a CFO or a CEO or something. So you can just keep driving the combine if that's what you're going to do. You need, or maybe you need an accountant. 
you need yep. somebody in here because a lot of times the, the businesses that call us have, have essentially outgrown their ability to manage is what it comes down to. They, they'll call us and we either get called by the younger generation or the senior generation. It's about 50, 50. Cause if the, if the kids call us, they're like, dad's crazy and he won't listen to us and things aren't going the way they should. And, and we're farming 10,000 acres and, and we do a really good job of farming, but we're going backwards, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of times people are afraid to reach out when it's not terrible, but they could go to the next level yep. and you can't get to the next level until you can recognize what needs to change and be willing to adjust and adapt and to trust other people to do certain things because you so, can't do everything. I got two quick thoughts on what you're saying there, Chris. And the first one I'll tie back to, uh, you know, some people need to hire their boss. Some people need to hire an accountant. Some people need to hire a, a tillage operator, but the ultimate message there is, is ownership and accountability of your farm. So if you're that person and you know, you're not doing something as well as you should be, you know, that you're not communicating with your team. You know, that you're not spending enough time at your desk. You know, that you're maybe lacking in agronomics from my military background, the buck has to stop somewhere. So is it with you? And if the buck stops with you do something about it, you know, our, our job as consultants is not always to be your friend. Our job is to come in and say, you're not doing this very well and you better do something about it. Otherwise, nothing is going to change. The second thought that I had there from your guys' conversation is whether it's the, the person bench pressing at the gym or it's the one that wants to go hop in the tillage tractor. There's, there's a lot of recreational tillage going on right now because it's November 30th and it's beautiful in Illinois, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, why not can, go? Why not go and burn some diesel, compact your soil, and create some erosion problems? Shit, let's go out there and make some tillage. And I believe in people doing the things that make them happy. And if they think it's going to improve their yields, everybody can manage their farm operation their own way. But the message there is, you can be happy or you can be informed, right? Mm -hmm. And if things are not necessarily stacking up to be good in 2022, but they made a whole bunch of money in 2021, they'd rather go sit out and do the tillage and get that stuff done then look and stare at the gut wrenching fact that we are going to have to make better and bigger decisions in 2022. So again, back to the message there on that is extreme accountability, extreme ownership. Someone has to do it. Is it going to be you and your team? And, and I think the business minded farmer in 2022 needs to understand that. We call this the what business minded farms should know in 2022. And we said there's three big things. We spend a lot of time on working capital because that's the most important thing. Let's face it. This is a business. That's why it's called the business of agriculture podcast, because, you know, I still have it. I'm out here in my metropolitan, my, my home in Phoenix. And, oh, that must be so neat. And they see the pictures of my round bales and my red barns. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, um, uh, there's still a business side of this. And I'm, I'm essentially renting out most of it and have a little hobby side of it. But let's face it. It's still th that thing all happened and was purchased because I think like a business person and these are businesses. And that brings us into, we talked about tools, decision-making tools could be a consultant tools could be your accountant tools. Also, you made a brilliant point there, Shay. Let's not allow, let's not, let's not say, cause this is what a lot of folks do. Like you said, well, this is just a nine sixteenth inch wrench, but since I'm comfortable with it, let's see if it can also be a screwdriver. And it's like, no, no, no. Just because you like your accountant doesn't mean they should be the person guiding your decision making on um, on input purchases, et cetera. But we talked about being proactive. You said something there, uh, both of you. Um, you said about uh, the proactive part of it is, you know, putting the people in that can make the decisions. Uh, Chris talks about communication, uh, and then Shay with the military thing talks about by God, who is in charge. And then that person is held accountable. And are those the two big things that if you're going to be proactive right now, be proactive by putting somebody in charge and then really looking harder. Cause you said we get real sloppy, you know, we get sloppy with our money when we, when we have it sloshing around is now when we should be really buckling down between now and, and January 1st on the money, what should we be doing? Well, that's a, that's a question. Like I would ask, there's a lot of questions in that question, but I would say one of the things that we like to do is stress test the business. Once we get the plan put together. So when you do that again, it's asking the question from the management side of what happens if you get ran over by a beer truck tomorrow and you can't perform. Okay. And you're out of the picture. What's the plan? Who's cross trained, who can do what you do. You have to have, every position in the business needs to be 
cross, he needs to be cross referenced. Okay. And then that's, that's on the management side. That's the people side, but we also want to stress test the financials. We want to say, okay, what if the productivity or the sales, if you're a retailer and sales because of the availability is 50%. I mean, we saw that back in the a uh, couple of years ago when um, we had a client who was a seed sales rep who, who the prevent plant was half and he had an employee selling seed and he had half the commission come in. He had to let his, his person go. So, you know, you get, you need to run these stress tests and say, okay, if, if X, Y, Z happens, what is, you know, plan B plan C, like I said, in the beginning, is having these, these um, what we call contingency plans for the possibilities that may occur. And, and, that, and you don't want to spend a ton of time on that. It's kind of like an exit strategy. When you put um, something new together, the, one of the first things we look at is, okay, how do we get out of it? Because everything that has a beginning has an end. We got to figure out, okay, how do we get out of that? You know, and again, you don't spend a ton of time on it, but you sure better think of it or otherwise it's really, it's, it's those types of things are what take businesses down. So, so the first, the first question you had there, Damien is, do you need to put someone in charge? And, and the answer to that ultimately is someone needs to understand the whole picture of what's happening in your, in your business, right. In your farm operation, in your ag business, and your, doesn't matter what you're doing. And what we see in this time period between now, you know, we're recording this here, the end of November and, and to that January 1st or, you know, into February timeframe is you need to be able to explain what happened in your business over the last year. And Chris, Chris has done a finan uh, phenomenal job on the financial piece and on the strategic outlook in his farm operation. And we have hence worked with many other farm operations across the United States and Canada, helping them develop that presentation back, right? Because there are a lot of people that are going to be going to their lenders, going to their investors, going to their business partners and need to understand the picture of where they're at in the business. So yes, someone needs to be in charge of that. And someone in your operation needs to understand the complete picture there. The second thing is with the financials, you know, some of those things that need to be in place uh, by January 1st is that cash flow. Uh, you need to understand where you're at um, from a from a tax standpoint, right? So, have you been meeting with your CPA? Are you getting with them between now and the end of the year so that these important decisions for 2022 can be put in place? What is your capital expenditure outlook for 2022? How many dollars do you need to spend either on intermediate assets to pay down long term debt uh, to add team members into your operation? That's one key picture, and then finally in relation to that is what working capital do you have available? So everybody has these wants and needs and wishes, and you need to take time to prioritize each one of those. So what are the needs and those capital expenditures that are going to be coming out of your working capital? Number one is probably taking a look at that crop. You know, what input expense increases do we need to pay for? Uh, and the reason for that is number one way to reduce your cost of production is to increase your yield. So your yield plus your um, productivity overall and your return to management or more importantly that cost of production is is three key factors that as you head into 2022 you better have a good wrap on what's going on in your farm business i would echo that and just say too it's it's really about having a margin target i don't care what what business you're in i don't care if you're an airline or if you're a farm or any business in between you know what your costs are and you need to know what your target is for your margin because you can't always hit the high price, right? And especially in commodities for, for farm operations, you, you, can't, you can't know exactly where that's going to be or set that, but you can set a margin target. And that's a heck of a lot easier to hit than a price target because I don't know where the price is going for one minute to the next. But I do know that if I achieve that, that target that I have, you know, now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden you're making hay and you're, you're moving forward. The business is going to, going to thrive and, and do better. These guys are talking about things you got to do now and think about rolling into the new year to take your farming operations to the next level. If this is of interest to you, the Chris Barron and Shea Folk uh, operation of AgView Solutions puts on the AgView Executive Business Conference. They're going to be doing it January 27th to the 28th, 2022. That's right. So the beginning of the year, 
what better time for the business minded farm to say, you know what we need? We need to actually get get off our, our butt here and really think about this as a business and make some of these decisions. And also we need to be around people that can help us do that. So the Ag View Executive Business Conference, January 27th, 28th in lovely Phoenix, Arizona. That's right. Not too far from my winter place. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to be one of the speakers. I'm going to be, I'm going to be there on day number, uh, on day number uh, one, as it turns out. And uh, you can come and watch me. You can also hear from Paul Niefer. He was on this very podcast about 10 episodes ago. He's known as the farm CPA. Very much encourage you to go and listen to that because a very sharp dude talking about the numbers again. And some of you that just want to drive combines, you hate talking about numbers. Great get used to driving a combine. You'll be doing it for somebody else in another 10 years because business farming is a business. Um, Joe Vaklovic, Marketing Economic Outlook. Chris Barron's going to talk some more about multi-generational business models, risk management from Shea Folk. You're going to hear from me about the business of agriculture. Jim Wiesemeyer, you might know him from uh, Pro Farmer. Um, it's Pro Farmer, correct? With Jim yep, Wiesemeyer. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he's been on this podcast in the past. He's been on my he's been my guest a couple of different times. Great, great outlook on what happens in Washington, D.C. Bill Connerly, who's going to be talking about the economy, and Steve Johnson, uh, crop insurance decisions along with shallow loss products. Not exactly sure what that is. I think that's when something goes into a ditch and it's not down very deep. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. all right. So it's the executive uh, business conference put on by AgView Solutions, January 27th, 28th. And I'm going to be one of the speakers. I just gave you the rest of the lineup. If you want to learn more about it, where do you go, guys? It's uh, agviewsolutions.com. And you can click on the top. There's a conference button that will tell you more about where the event's located uh, yeah, I mean, there's some four star restaurants there, beautiful golf courses, Damien, for you to go practice your golfing. I think that's what a shallow loss product is, actually, when you throw your golf club into one of the water terrain features. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, number, the number five iron is my buddy. Um, a couple of the other irons have not been my buddies. The most recent one to take a tumble was the driver. It refuses to be my buddy. The driver has been... Um, it's been threatened and it has been thrown around because it just doesn't want to work with me. So uh, it's yeah. just, it's just a couple of clubs now that we have this problem on one of the wedges and the driver. Those are the two problems. I think you'll get her figure out, but yeah, agviewsolutions.com click on the conference button. And, and, you know, you did a great overview on that, Damien. The most important part I think is when we talk about these strategic resource teams, who do you need to be reaching out to, to make better decisions in 2022 for your farm operation? Uh, this lineup right here is going to get you thinking on on the right things to help you better manage your farm business as we move into the year ahead. There's another thing that, you know, sometimes when you're uh, a farming operation, maybe you do like what I do. Some of us really, we work in our own little silos. You know, we do we do uh, kind of work out here. We, we plot along somewhat independently and uh, even in an isolated manner. There are going to be other intelligent, successful, business-minded farm operators attending this conference that you can have a drink with and talk to them and they're not your neighbors. So you know what? That means there's a degree of confidentiality. So you can actually say, hey, you know, I need somebody to bounce this off of. And that's what is great about this. And there's another thing that's pretty cool about it. This is not sponsored. You just pay your thousand bucks and you go to it. If it were sponsored, you could go for free and then you'd be getting chased around like the last girl at closing time, the entire time at this conference. But instead you actually just get to go there and learn and network and you don't get, uh, you don't get hassled by people trying to sell you stuff full time. So go to agviewsolutions.com and check this out. Chris, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. And I want to add to that, Damien, um, you, you said exactly what I was thinking. I, I wanted to say it. I think the networking is, is going to be phenomenal and that's really what we hear, we sent a survey out to get feedback from from people that we figured would probably want to attend. And and networking is is always the best part of any conference, um, you know. And, and the thing that we've got also with that is, and I know you'll be there that whole first day. Uh, we have a welcome ceremony that that evening before, and you'll be there that whole first day. And the whole thing that I, mean, I told you and all the other presenters will be there the entire time. I know you have a conflict on that last day, yeah. but from the standpoint of producers that can make it to this event, you have a one on one connection with people like yourself, Damien, and all these other um, great educators that are going to be there. And to me, that that says a lot because you know, this is the meeting for these executive minded producers. It's not a meeting for promotion. It's not a meeting about AgView. It's not a meeting about anything, but these producers 
networking, learning from each other, getting some education and taking something home that can take their business to the next level. That's really why we're doing it. Yeah. And again, it's only, you're talking about a thousand bucks. Uh, and so, you know, $995 and for you to see this lineup of speakers, also the networking and also to be somewhere that's quite nice. Uh, it's, it's well worth it. So, I mean, obviously I work the meeting circuit and this is going to be a good one. So anyway, his name's Shay Folk. The other guy on here is Chris Barron. They are at Agview Solutions. Check them out. They're uh, not only clients of mine that I've worked with on this, but also I have them on here from time to time because they have smart uh, lessons, information, and insights to share. And they've done that today. Thanks for being on guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Damien. Till next time it's the business of agriculture. This episode of the business of agriculture was brought to you by land trust landowners. Just like you are increasing profitability by adding recreation to their portfolio of land use. Millions of recreators actively seek wide open spaces for bird watching, photography, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, and many other farm and ranch activities. Owners of farm and ranch properties are partnering with Recreation Access Network Land Trust. Land Trust is an online platform connecting recreators with landowners for outdoor experiences on their land to increase profitability. Visit landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to learn more. That's landtrust.com slash BOA.